How does Toronto's Chinatown inspire author Wayne Ng? Today on All About Canadian Books, we're going to find out. But before we do, for the latest author interviews and behind the book so stories, please hit that subscribe button. Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher and welcome back. I am very excited to have author Wayne Ng as a guest this week. Wayne is an award-winning short story and travel writer and a school social worker. And we'll be discussing Wayne's second novel, Letters from Johnny. Now, Letters from Johnny takes us back to 1970. Johnny Wong is in grade five and he's a lonely boy who tries to stick handle a neighborhood of immigrants and draft dodgers. Johnny's world unravels after a murder, a betrayal, and the unexpected emergence of a family member. All this as he tries to make sense of the FLQ crisis. His only solace are letters to a pen pal, then to Dave Keon, captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Welcome to All About Canadian Books, Wayne. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you so much for having me. Glad well, to be I'm, here. I'm very excited to have you because I just finished Letters from Johnny. And it was such a charming, fun read. I, I just loved it. Oh, thank you for saying. My pleasure. My pleasure. And I've also been, Wayne, I have to confess, I was on your website looking at all of your fabulous travel pictures. <laughs> and you have me absolutely drooling. Like, I can't wait to go to Jordan. And my first question for you is, how do all of these incredible travels inspire your writing? Oh, geez. Um, I think most writers have a high degree of curiosity and imagination. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think you travel like I do, you know, <laughs> where you just sort of you're comfortable stepping outside of the known and the familiarity and that you're willing to put yourself into situations and places and among people that are might be might be a bit unpredictable but the payoff is huge yeah. so i think traveling the, the way you and i travel because i've been on your website as well <laughs> um there's adventure there right yeah. there's a lot of imagination there's creativity there's vulnerability, and these are all elements involved in the writing process if you really want to create meaningful, inventive, different scenarios and characters. So um, it's, I mean, the, your mind is just, it's just so open and aware and unfiltered when you're traveling. And it's, it's very similar to the writing process in, in that respect. Yeah. I, I Absolutely, absolutely. And I have to ask, when things open up and we can get back on a plane, what's your next trip going to be? Oh, God. <laughs> I have such a long list of places I've been wanting to go. Um, uh -huh. But I'd have to say Uzbekistan. Um, oh. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of ancient Islamic architecture. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever Googled it, but like the mm -hmm. images, the architecture, it's absolutely stunning. And it's a different world, which you know, you and I both acknowledge we like to plant our feet in. Yeah. Um, and I like to be taken away to places where um, I've not been. And like, there's something about the Islamic world that's, that's just fascinating because you know you're somewhere different. Yes, the buses probably run, run on time, the toilets flush, presumably. I don't know, <laughs> but just the call, the call to prayer, you know, yeah. um, tells you, you know, number of times every day, you're not home, you're not anywhere close to mm -hmm. home. And I love that feeling. And I've been eyeballing that for a number of years. So that would probably be among my two or three places that I'd like to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I, I have to agree, there's something about the call to prayer, like I, 
love it. Like it just, yeah. it's, it's so beautiful. Yeah. Now you're, it now, is. now you're taking him, me away on my travel. My well, you know, you have to dream, you have to hope and look, look ahead. Cause we know it's going to happen. We just don't know when, That's but right. you know, it's, um, just as I'm looking for ideas to write, I'm often looking for ideas of places to travel. The two are synonymous. They're always, they're ongoing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll, we'll dream together. <laughs> yeah. Now you, I mean, your website took me to another world, but your book also took me to another world. Like Wayne, I am, I'm dazzled at your recall of, of, of your childhood memories. And you said that as a child, you ran wild in Toronto's Chinatown. And that was a big source of the inspiration for Letters from Johnny. Mm -hmm. Can you tell viewers a little more about this running wild through Chinatown, please? Well, you have to, you have to know it was 1970 and parenting was very different back then as well. Mm -hmm. And Johnny's mother is distracted, just like my parents were distracted. So Johnny and I were, were I inspired Johnny and Johnny <laughs> inspired me. Um, so I grew up a lot with that. Um, parenting was free range. Um, and there were a lot of us. So I roamed far and wide the nooks, alleyways and crannies of Chinatown. I don't know how, how well you know Toronto, but I... You know, I, I covered a fairly wide territory. You know, arguably, I'm still doing it, but I do it on a plane, and now it's global. Um, but um, I'm sorry, I've lost your question. Oh, just no, 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 that's okay. Just how um, how did Chinatown inspire letters from Johnny? Okay, Chinatown was my backyard. You know, it was a couple of blocks from my house, just like Queen's Park was a couple blocks away. Uh, my parents were uh, of a different generation. There were immigrant parents who were concerned with just putting food on the table. Mm -hmm. So I think they relied on us looking after ourselves, which nowadays probably wouldn't fly very well. Uh, this being the age of helicopter parenting and pandemic parenting. Um, so they were okay with me doing whatever I wanted, which meant roaming wherever I want, as far as I want it until, until I was hungry, right? Mm -hmm. um, so downtown was my turf. Downtown was my backyard. I got to know it really well. Um, and it was a very inspiring, very dynamic area to grow up. I mean, the street itself, um, at the top of it was the University of Toronto, College Street. Two short blocks away was Baldwin Village, and back then it was it was a student ghetto. It's also where all the draft dodgers hung and partied. And in between, you had rooming houses, you had immigrants coming and going, you had people who had lived in the community a long time. There was it was because it was downtown. It was such a beehive and a buzz of activity. So this was not some sleepy, placid, you know, suburb. This was an area that was constantly you know, swirling with activity and sound and movement. Oh, I, I, I loved it. Like when you, when I was reading your book, I just had such a picture of, of you as a little boy <laughs> traveling through, through this area. And you, you've also said, Wayne, that there's a very fine line between your character and also yourself mm -hmm. and as writing this story as an adult what did you learn about yourself that's a very good question um you know i had a less than idyllic childhood you know there's i, I don't in any way glamorize johnny's life even though it's a work of fiction there's elements of my own life there uh my didn't always have it together. We certainly had issues of poverty. They were new to the country, even though I was born in Canada. They didn't have the language skills. Um, we were no stranger to uh, alcohol, to um, 
a lack of parenting. So these were things that I didn't confront when I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. These are things that are coming out more now, but they somehow I created an avatar in Johnny to sort of expunge, you know, some of the more painful and less savory moments of my childhood. Mm -hmm. You know, and I did that through the novel, not realizing that it was cathartic for me. Mm -hmm. So um, I've had more time reflecting on on the novel and my childhood after I wrote the book. So yeah. I, I think I subconsciously channeled it into the book, you know, because there's a lot of authenticity and accuracy in the characters, the neighborhood, the tone, the atmosphere, they're all, all real. Um, I didn't intend it to be about me, but there's so much of me in there. And I think that's probably what made it so genuine in that I, you know, Johnny, Johnny was already formed in my head. And you know how some writers, they, they're, they're writing their characters, their novels, and they're not always sure where they're gonna go. And they're pretty good with the characters leading the way as they take on a life of their own. For me, he was already put together. He was already formed. I didn't know how the novel was going to end, but I, I knew who he was. I just had to create a voice for him. Wow. And you did. And I absolutely loved his, um, his hero, like Dave, Dave Keon. Uh, also your hero as well, I understand. Absolutely, like yeah. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And why was he such a hero for you? Oh, well, back then, the Leafs were the only game in town um, that mattered to me and family. So food and hockey brought us together. Yeah. And, you know, I, I suggested that I didn't really have hands-on parenting. So as a child, you're always looking for role models. You're always looking for heroes. And that often starts with images on TV, superheroes, you know. Dave Keon was was huge at that time. He was he represented sportsmanship and fair mindedness and, and excellence at what he did. And what he provided me and the character in, 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 in the novel is a moral foundation. Mm -hmm. So in the novel, just like in my, you know, in my own life. I, I may have worshipped him, but he, he doesn't really speak in the novel. I mean, there are letters to him, and I don't want to give up, give away too much, but yeah. he looms large, right? Because he is this overhanging presence that Johnny talks to, and Johnny apologizes for wanting to punt somebody, or when he does get in fight, you know, he says, I'm sorry, Mr. Keon, I know you wouldn't have done that. So um, he's, he's that father figure that Johnny needed, and I think every kid needs. And as, as a reader, Wayne, I, I really enjoyed when Johnny first starts writing his letters he, to his pen pal, he, seemed, right. he seems a little <laughs> reluctant, right. but as he gets going, you know, his letters get longer and more detailed and it's so charming, his spelling and his grammar. When you started writing Johnny's story um was was that your intention for his his uh letter writing to grow be more finessed as he kept going or did that mm. happen organically uh that's a good question I think when I originally conceived of Johnny uh, and and structuring the novel I probably started off with a third person which is the way a lot of novels do, right? But I, I found that I, I couldn't get the degree of intimacy and voice that I really wanted. And then I thought of doing first person, which is always risky because, you know, first person point of view, you're, you're trying to intimately convey a singular view as well as everybody else's, right? And you're trying to develop character, not only the first person but everybody else's and you're trying to advance plot and motivation these are these are risky challenging things for you know, to undertake in epistolary form in letter writing form but i i thought you know in i'm going to digress a little bit during this pandemic people have started writing letters to one another and i'm not talking about emails 
the actual craft of pen and paper, lick a stamp on it, send it away. And yeah. my wife just did that with my nephew. They have this back and forth going because it shows such intimacy and vulnerability. And this is what letter writing, why it works for Johnny, because we see him, he's a reluctant writer at first, because it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's a pen palace that his teacher makes him do. He doesn't see value in it. Um, and he struggles with the punctuation, spell, grammar, and all those things, you know, and truth of the matter, most 11 year old writings are, they're not publishable. They would be either uninteresting or they would just, they would frustrate the reader, right? So I thought I would use that. You know, I, I, was, I thought I would game that a little bit and leverage that and sh show how his growth was tied to his writing as well as the rest of the story. So he starts off really choppy. And as his character develops, as the plot develops, as the backstory of the FLQ develops, they all move in unison and we see his writing improve at the same time mm -hmm. until they, they sort of by the end, as you, as you said, um, not that they're perfect letters, but he's a different kid. His yeah. writing is different. His personality is different. Mm -hmm. The way he sees things have evolved and the stories have moved along. So uh, it was purposeful in unifying and amplifying the backstory and the writing at the same time. Mm -hmm. And are you also, do you have a big history, um, an interest in history as well, Wayne? Well, um, I loved history as a kid. Yeah. Um, so um, when the FLQ would have been out on the streets, Johnny, like myself, I would have been fascinated with seeing tanks and soldiers there because they would have represented war, World War II, World War I. I knew all there was to know about uh, <laughs> armed conflicts. Yeah, I was a kid, okay, <laughs> looking for heroes. If they weren't Dave Peon, they were soldiers. <laughs> so uh, I studied and read so much about wars and, and, you know, so the FLQ would have been fascinating because it would have Mm -hmm. represented armed conflict which would have, would have been exciting but to digress again my first novel finding the way is actually uh ancient historical fiction ancient chinese historical fiction which there's not isn't a lot of so i had to do a lot of research i didn't have a lot of primary sources but yeah i love history and that's one of the reasons, reasons like you you love to travel because there's yeah. so much history in just about wherever you go yeah yeah now um would anyone else who grew up in your neighborhood with you would they recognize themselves in your novel um yeah some of them would have <laughs> i assume passed away by now uh <laughs> Meanie ming who is the obsessive yeah. gardener um yeah she was very fairly close to a character we grew up with couple doors away. The Catwoman, who's the neighborhood Boo Radley character. Um, I, I don't know what became of her, but she was a much older woman who had cats. Barry Arbel, um, a boy I grew up with. He was there. The teachers, the principal, uh, Rolly, who um, in the story is a draft dodger, but my childhood memories, I don't think he was. Yeah, but he was this Jack Nicholson, easy rider kind of character, which was just easy to create um, because there were draft dodgers down the street. Um, my mother's fictionalized, but she was drawn from a number of other characters that um, I grew up with as a kid, you know, Love of Amal Jong and Johnny Walker Red. Um, of course, Dave Keon, yeah. <laughs> though he's not from the street, yeah. But yeah, there are a lot of characters in there who are derivatives of people that I grew up with, including names in, in the school, some of the, the childhood uh, students that I, I had. Okay. And um, one of my second last question for you is, you know, certainly, re I mean, people have been doing a lot of reading during the pandemic. Um, I really enjoyed your read of Letters from Johnny because it just took me, it transported me to another place. What is your hope for other readers who have read your book? 
Well, I think for writers, there are a number of things that they, they want to do. And a big one might be to entertain the reader and to give you exactly, as you said, a transportive moment, you know, a bit of an escape. Um, I'm kind of hoping I provided that without, without making it sound you know, uh, less than because, I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic and, yeah. you know, we, we've just came out of four years of Trumpism where we Canadians, you know, felt vicariously traumatized and, you know, <laughs> there was some emotional collateral damage by our, with our proximity to the U.S. So, you know, if, if I can provide three, four hours of reflective escape, mm -hmm. but also very thoughtful as well, then I, as a writer, you think you, you've done your job, um, but I, I think one of the things that I've enjoyed hearing is uh, a mother that she read it with her daughter, who's 12. Actually, I've had a couple of families tell me uh, that it led to wider discussions about racism yes. uh, back then. Now it led to wider discussions about Quebec nationalism. What was the FLQ all about? So while it gives that transportative escape which we all need it also led to more meaningful thoughtful discussions um, afterwards yes and i would have to agree because i certainly walked away thinking things i thought oh i never thought of that the social worker going in the fridge you know and looking for milk and bread right and, and it's just like I never, you know, you, you just little things like that. And also, you you made the comment about, you know, the police officer, you know, doing kung fu moves, and you know, like just. And as a child, right. how that just wasn't cool, for right? You, you know, in your book, and I thought that's that was a really great way of getting people to think to think about the world <clears throat> from an, another lens, really. Mm hmm. Yeah, the words race or racism in the book at all, and it wasn't yeah. intended to highlight that, but it, it was part of my upbringing. It was part mm -hmm. of how I interacted with the wider world. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it was part of how the wider world tried to interact with new Canadians coming in. So, mm -hmm. you know, as a child, we didn't have the terms racism. We, it was never discussed. I think it's for, the furthest we ever got was with my parents, they would say, they just don't like Chinese people. And we would end it at that because mm -hmm. we didn't want to go there. It was uncomfortable territory for us. Yeah. We just wanted to eat the slights and fit in and not rock the boat and be the model minorities just to, to achieve academic and economic success. And that was the, the recipe for you know uh, the middle-class dream. So I think there's still a lot of that, but I mean, we can talk about these things now. We have the sophistication of the language now that we didn't back then. I mean, like you said, for Johnny, things just didn't feel right. I mean, yeah, there's there's a couple of times in the novel where Rolly and uh, somebody else, they, they pull their eyes back to yeah. mock the Chinese and they're trying to be funny. And that's about as overt as the racism got, but mm -hmm. there was a lot of that. And then there's times it's, like, like you said, it's really subtle, like a couple of cops are pulling a good cop, bad cop routine on Johnny. And one mm -hmm. of them is, you know, trying to do Kung Fu moves on Johnny to pretend that he's cool and he can connect and bond with them. And Johnny's like, this is so stupid. This is dumb, yeah. you know? Yeah. So he feels it both viscerally and, and subtly. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it was crafted because that's the way we probably dealt with things back then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Yeah. Um, Wayne, what are you working on right now? Well, I, I wish I could tell you I had a new project, but um, I think if you're a serious writer, you're always working, but in different ways. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm promoting and I'm selling the current book, Letters from Johnny. And I, I'm trying to flog my third novel, which is completely different. It's, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a mother who leads a very chaotic, messy, dysfunct dysfunctional dumpster kind of life. 
drawn heavily from my social work experiences. So, you know, you, you're, you're in constant cell mode, yeah. uh, which is the, the side of writing that writers probably like the least because it, <laughs> it involves a lot of promotion, right? And you're putting yourself out there. I really would rather be writing it. Um, so I don't have a current project, but in the absence of a current project, I'm selling, I'm promoting. Yeah. I'm working on crafts, so I've constantly got books or podcasts going, um, such as yours, uh, listening to other writers talk about craft, listening to other writers talk about technique, how they work things. Mm -hmm. um, I've got magazines on the go about writing, and, and you're, you're always reading because one of the best ways mm -hmm. to contribute to your craft or build your craft is to read other people's work. So mm -hmm. I feel that I've got a lot of things on the go. I wish it was uh, a new project, but I know it's coming. Um, I also know I can't force it because then it, it it sounds and it feels contrived. And I, I had a follow-up novel to my first novel going. You know, I put hours and hours into the research and I got the first chapter written and then it felt labored, you know, it felt yeah. forced and it just didn't feel right. So I put it down because it, you want it to come from your gut, right? Yes. You want it to, yeah, you, you want the whole project to, you, you want to inhabit that project and it just wasn't happening for me. Mm -hmm. So I actually have lots on the go, which is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I am really excited for you. Letters from Johnny, um, as I was saying, is a charming, and a fun read and I thoroughly enjoyed it and I'm so excited that I got to not only read it just read it but to talk to you about it so thank you so much for being such a great guest oh thanks for having me Crystal this was a lot of fun uh, I've loved your other interviews and I look forward to uh, seeing more of them and who knows maybe our paths will cross on the uh, trail <laughs> that's, yeah, that, yeah wouldn't that that's be cool right. That's yeah. right. Oh, I'd love that. And actually, yeah. um, next week, Wayne, I do have another Guernica author. It's um, the book is Choosing Eleanor. Oh, by good Andre, choice. Yeah, Andre Gratton and translated by Ian Thomas Shaw. So I'm so yeah. excited to yeah. talk yeah. to both of both of them and thrilled to talk to you as well yeah so i'll look forward to that yeah <laughs> thank you and thank thanks you so much again. i okay. will put links down below in the description box so that um, our viewers <clears throat> can go to wayne's website uh, purchase a copy of letters from johnny or his first novel or also you i highly recommend that you look at wayne's travel photos because it's such a great way to explore another part of the world while we're at home right now. Okay. So. Yeah. Oh, I want to suggest you check out my book trailer as well. It's oh, on yes. YouTube. Yes, exactly. I'll put a link down below to that as well too. Great. All right. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank you, Crystal. All right.